2. I'm going to get right into the Bible with you tonight. Ephesians 3, 2, and then we'll get into the uh, special singing. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 2. We're going to be moving quickly because I've got a lot of ground to cover with you tonight. We're we'll talking about a lot of stuff. <clears throat> this is what you call a condensed message. You know, Reader's Digest condenses everything. And, well, I'm going to try to cram two hours worth of preaching into about 30 minutes. Ephesians 3, 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in, in 3, 2. I'm in 2. I'm in 2. Am I got the right glasses on here? <laughs> 3, 2. <laughs> First, verse 1, for this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now watch this. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Father, bless this holy book now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Of all men that ever lived, folks, the Apostle Paul was definitely the Apostle of dispensations. For God revealed not only mysteries to him, but the dispensation. I am a dispensationalist. I believe that portions of the Bible fit in certain places during certain periods of time to certain people. I do not believe all the Bible is written to the same people. I believe it's written to different people, different ages, for different reasons. We can profit from all the Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But the dispensation is a definite way in helping us understand the layout and the thinking of God's mind as He relates to humanity. We live in the dispensation of the grace of God right now. God is no longer angry with the wicked. He put out a olive branch, 2 Corinthians 5. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and hath, and, has, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The all judgment now is given to the hand of the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who will do the judging. And he bought that uh, to judge. So in this dispensation of the grace of God, the Jews have been blinded. And because the Jew is blinded, focus now is upon the Gentile nations and the times of the Gentiles, which are quickly running out. We are coming to the point where the fullness of the Gentiles is going to be brought into complete fruition, and the times of the Gentiles, the Daniel's image in 606 B.C., were coming down to the feet of iron mixed with clay. We're there, folks. We're at that point. The church does not replace Israel. I do not believe in replacement theology. I believe Israel has a specific place in the Bible. They are there. God's blinded them, and God will open their eyes again at the second advent. We do not take the place of Israel. Some of the modern heresies that are being preached today, though, are the Hebrew Roots Movement, Manifest Sons of God, and the Emergent Church. All of these movements deny the finished work of Christ. They all are focused on this earth and this kingdom and we are preparing for the coming. They are preparing. All of them are preparing for the coming of the Antichrist, and they're going to be part of his kingdom. Make no mistake about it. In John chapter number 18, verse number 36, turn there with me tonight. John 18, 36, we read these words. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants do what? There goes your pacifism right there. My servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now turn to Luke 22, verse 36. Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 36. To help you continue in the context of fight what he's talking about. Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 36. Here's what he says. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Watch verse 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Now what does that mean? <coughs> to the one who said, if they smite you on one cheek, turn the other. In the Sermon on the Mount, remember that? But remember that you are a dispensationalist. If you, if, you have, if, you, if you, in your own study of the Bible, understand that God now is not preaching the kingdom gospel to the Jews. We are not preaching the Sermon on the Mount. We are preaching the gospel of the grace of God. They're taking Christ 
and they're going to nail him on a cross. He says to his disciples, get ready for the future. Get you a sword. You'll need it. That's what this is about. He's preparing them for the coming time, which will be soon, when he is not with them, and that they will be forced to defend their families and defend themselves if necessary. That's exactly what he's talking about. You could take a thousand Christians, 10,000 out of the average liberal denominations in America, they don't even know that's in there, and then ask out of them, ask them to give you an interpretation of what Christ is talking about. I read some of the commentary today on that scripture. Here's what most of them say. That's not literal. That's a tough one to say it's not literal. So he says plainly to them, go buy a sword. They come back and say, Master, we have two. He said, that's enough. Does that sound literal to you? Of course it is. And here's the point. He's being taken away from them. And by being taken away from them, they are left here on this earth and they must take care of their families and their loved ones and themselves. They do not go out seeking violence. Folks, violence will find you. It will find you. Make no mistake about it. But the sword that he mentions here is a real sword. And the reason that you understand it differently from uh, smite on one cheek or smite the other is because you do not live in that age of the kingdom gospel. That age is coming again. And the laws of that age are entirely different from this time that you live in now. It's coming to where on this earth that if a man dares to preach the word of God, the Bible says that his parents will run him through and say, you lie in the name of the Lord. Now, who's ever heard of a time like that? It's not now. We are told to go out and preach the word of God. If you look at the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, you'll find the last part of the 11th chapter of Hebrews. One of the things of the faithful is that they put to fight. They fought the enemies. So now I'm not up here tonight preaching to you like an imam is in, the, in a Muslim church, telling you to go out and make bombs and blow people up. Not at all. What I'm telling you is that you have every right, every right to exist on this earth and preach the gospel of Christ and defend your family. And that's what the sword is about here now. I want you to look at these three movements that I'm talking about, and I want you to get a context of what's going on. The Hebrew Roots Movement. I've talked to you about that before in Sunday school, just exactly what is the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now note carefully, if you're a dispensationalist and you believe that you live in the dispensation of the grace of God, then don't let anybody judge you by a meat or by a holy day or by feast days, or anything like that. Don't ever let anybody come along and hang something over the top of your head and tell you, well, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. You're supposed to keep this feast day. You're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. You're supposed to do this, supposed to do that. What do you mean by I'm supposed to do it? Am I not saved by believing on Christ? Or do I believe on Christ plus that? Because the bottom line is, I'm going to fail. But I don't intend to fail. And the Apostle Paul said of the law, he said it was a burden that we couldn't bear. That is an honest assessment. That's looking at it from a, from a purely pragmatic point of view. We love the law. We respect the law. We want to keep the law. But we also know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So with my flesh I serve the law of sin, and with my mind I serve the law of God. Yes, sir, I'm not telling you to break the law. I'm not telling you at all to do that. But, I'm not telling, but I am certainly not telling you that you have to keep Passover, you have to keep Pentecost, you have to keep the Feast of Weeks, you have to keep the Feast of First Fruits, you have to keep Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, or, the, or uh, Yom Suf, the, 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 the Day of Booth, the, the Booth, the Tabernacle. You don't have to keep that. All of these feast days have their complete, completion and fulfillment in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the Hebrew Roots Movement. All Christians must adhere to a kosher diet. Now, granted, we would probably all benefit somewhat by changing our diet. But let me tell you this. I purposely eat certain things to remind people of what God said to Peter. When he saw unclean things on that sheet, God said, Do not call unclean what I have cleansed. And I have Baptist brethren that mean well. 
that come along and tell you that you cannot eat pork or this or that. Now, my friend, they are as dead wrong as they can be. If you can eat it before it can eat you, <laughs> go to. <laughs> so why? Because of the principle. The principle is that you are saved by the grace of God, not what you eat or don't eat. And he said, what I've cleansed, all manner of four-footed beast, unclean beast. The point he was making to Peter was, the Gentile, I understand, is unclean. I know you cannot go into the house of an unclean Gentile, but Peter, I've cleansed him. And it's no longer Jew and Gentile. Now it's one believer in Christ Jesus made of twain one new man. No longer, folks, the body of Christ no longer has Jews and Gentiles. The body of Christ has believers, born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the there is no differentiation made. There's no distinction made between a Jew and a Gentile. Number two, the Sabbath can only be observed on Saturdays. The Hebrew Roots Movement are teaching people that the Sabbath can only be observed on Saturdays. Here's the problem with the Hebrew Roots Movement to begin with and Sabbatarians. There, if you want to read Romans chapter number 16, Colossians chapter number 3, and read it carefully, you'll find out that it says that plainly we do not have a Sabbath day. We have a Sabbath person. Our rest is in Christ. Hebrews chapter number, I think it's chapter number 4. Our rest is a person. The Sabbath was given to the Jew as a sign. But here they are. They're trying to drag you back under the law and force you to keep the Sabbath day. And then the Jewish festivals and holy days must still be observed today. That's the Hebrew Roots Movement, folks. There are probably saved people in the Hebrew Roots Movement. There are probably people in there who love the Lord, but they're dead wrong. They're dead wrong. They got messed up afterward. They got, saved. They got messed up afterward, didn't they, brother? No, sir. No man can get saved by keeping or doing anything. You have to trust one who's already kept and done it for you. Amen. And then there are the manifest sons of God. These are the ones who are a little more... <clears throat> uh, let me just read some of the quotes. Then you begin to get an understanding of what these people believe. Listen to this. God's people are going to start to exercise rule, and they're going to take dominion over the power of Satan. They're going to bring diabolical princes down. The dark powers that hover over the parliament buildings of the nations are going to be paralyzed by the corporate prayer of an authoritative community. As the rod of his strength goes out of Zion, he'll change legislation. He'll chase the devil off the face of God's earth. And God's people together doing the will of God will bring about God's purposes and God's reign. That's, that's, a, that's a buzzword. The latter rain movement. Do you see that happening? Does it say anywhere in the Bible that we're going to drive the devil from the face of the earth? Nowhere. That the world will be conquered through an elite group of overcomers who produce signs and wonders unlike anything ever seen, even in the early church by the apostles. This, they believe, will lead us to the greatest revival of history, an end time harvest of billions of souls where the majority of the world will be one to Christ and the kingdom will be established or ready to be received by Christ. Did you get that? We, by our effort, are going to convert the world, at least wise, bring it into dominion, to the dominion of Christ. And so therefore, when the Lord Jesus comes back, we're going to present him with the kingdom. No. Revelation chapter number 11 says plainly, he'll come and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. He will take that which rightfully belongs to Him. It won't be handed to Him. He'll take it. We are not going to build a kingdom. But churches are established on the idea of building kingdoms. And when they came to this country, they had a thing called Manifest Destiny. And it came from European theology that taught that the Anglo-Saxon... Western European, had a mandate from God to go conquer these lands and build a city on a hill, a city of the light, 
to bring, the, to bring this new land into submission and subjection to the church of God. And so when they came into America, that's exactly what they set about doing. And did they do that? Far from it. The church of the living God is a bride that is called out of this world. The word church is translation from the Greek word ekklesia, which means a called out assembly. The Lord said, Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Is that sound to you like that he's going to take the kingdoms of this world, the church is going to build the kingdoms of the world? No. No, it's not. <coughs> he said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, the church is going to be gone, and then when it leaves, a strong delusion is coming down upon this earth, and when that delusion comes down, then the kingdoms of this world will be gathered together, Revelation chapter 13, to the Antichrist, and he will become the king of the earth. And that's a study of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and its successive passage from one to the other. And right now, the God of this world is not the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of this world is Satan. And for all of the bluster and bragging and braggadocio that's coming from these people, talking about how that they are going to subject the world and bring their dominions and all of this, it's not happening, folks. If anything, it's gotten far worse just in the last 20 years. And this is the last statement I'll read for you. Angelic appearances will be common to the saints, and a visible glory of the Lord will appear upon some for extended periods of time as, as power flows through them. There will be no plague, disease, or physical condition, including lost limbs, AIDS, poison gas, or radiation, which will resist the healing and miracle gifts working in the saints during this time. They're going to bring a utopia upon the earth, a Shangri-La here on planet earth. Here's the problem with that. They cannot coexist with sin. The reason for all of the suffering, sickness, and sorrow on this earth now is S-I-N. That's where it all came from. It is a product of sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So how in the world do you think a mere human being is going to be able to bring all of this to earth while sin is running wild on planet earth? Not going to do it. When the Prince of Peace comes, He will bring to this earth healing power, anointing power, the unction of God. But even then, He will have to take a rod of iron and rule for a thousand years. And the reason He does that is for a thousand years, He's going to show the angels, the demons, the whole creation that unless the Holy Spirit does a work of grace in the heart of an individual, they will never willfully bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. We tonight are choosing to willfully bow before Him and acknowledge His Lordship over our lives because of the work of grace that has been done inside our hearts. That work of grace produces salvation. We become born-again believers because of that. Folks, evil men and seducers, principalities and powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places, that is exactly what's happening right now in this world. The elite of the elite, the ones who really pull the strings, are bringing about exactly what they want to bring on planet Earth. And it's happening exactly as God said it would. So, no, 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 we're not going to build a kingdom. We're not going to build a kingdom. What we're going to do is preach the gospel and watch him call people out of the kingdoms of this world and save. And then thirdly is this group right here the emergent church. And this is a scary bunch. And who is the emergent church? Now remember, you've got the Hebrew Roots Movement, Manifest Sons of God, then the emergent church. This makes up the vast majority of the people out here who go to churches every Sunday. Listen to this quote. I am for fidelity. I am for love. Whether it's a man and a, and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man, I think the ship has sailed and I think that the church needs to just, this is the world that we are living in, and we need to affirm people wherever they are. 
And the one who said that is one of the biggest teachers in the emerging church movement. These are the people who go to these churches scattered all over Knoxville and all over this country. They listen to this kind of stuff. You want to know why sodomy is running wild now? Because these guys sit on their stools and they tell this to the people. And here's what they're saying. This is pragmatism. This is pragmatism. What do you mean, preacher? This is saying, well, the Bible is outdated. And when the Bible talks about, in the book of Romans chapter number 1, it talks about sodomy. This is for their age. But for us today, if we're going to be relevant for the people that we minister to, we've got to affirm like that word, we have to affirm the culture that we're living in. Plain of words, we don't rock the boat. We don't go against anything. We just kind of go along with the tide, and we, and, we, and we teach the people how to worship God. One of the worst things that ever happened to the church, and this is important, folks, one of the worst things that ever happened to the church is a few decades ago when they began to change the focus from ministering the Word of God to worship a controlled worship. Worship leaders, worship music. What they've done is caused the people to go into a place where they've become part of this great feeling and excitement and movement and it has nothing to do with their relationship with God. They can go into a worship quote unquote service and they can feel good, get pumped up just like they would out here in any of these secular places and then go out feeling good about themselves and they call that church. The last thing they're going to hear in these churches is for some preacher to get up in front of them and preach doctrine to them. Why? Doctrine cleanses, separates, pinpoints the error, tells you what you need to do. It defines what you are. It tells you what you believe. They're not going to preach doctrine. Do doctrine is divisive. So every, these people can all come together. You've got a 1,000 of them, 5,000, 10,000. They're all in there jumping up and down and screaming and carrying on and yelling, and they're worshiping God, and they don't believe anything, and it makes no difference what they believe. It has nothing to do with it as long as they have a good worship experience. Now, I told you the truth. That's the truth, and that's not a church. Now, if you've got that kind of church, what do you think the Antichrist will have to do to take over? He's already taken over. It's full of his spirit. The minute you walk in it until you walk out of it, you're in the midst of demonic influence and a demonic spirit. And that's everywhere. And everybody in this house tonight probably has somebody in their family or some neighbor or some close person or somebody you know that's a member of a church like that. And have you noticed how these churches, these churches that are, that are so full of worship, so full of worship, they don't bother to come back on Sunday night. And they don't bother to come back on Wednesday night. They have that one powerful worship experience on Sunday morning. And on they go. That's sad. That's sick. If I end my life in the days of my life on this earth with five or ten people who want to sing the old songs and have prayer and preach the word, let it be. I am so sick of that garbage. I can't understand why people can't discern that spirit. That is such a sick spirit. We do not think this emerging church movement is about changing your worship service. We do not think this is about how you structure your church staff. This is actually about changing theology. This is about our belief that theology changes. The message of the gospel changes. It's not just the method that changes. I appreciate someone being candid. I appreciate honesty. Did you catch that? I mean, that's powerful. Let me read it again for you, okay? Let this settle in. We do not think this emerging church movement, he knows what it is, is about changing your worship service. We do not think this is about how you structure your church staff. This is actually about changing theology. This is about our belief that theology changes. Did you get that now? The message of the gospel changes. It's not just the method that changes. Now, folks, if you can, you know, I mean, you don't have to have an IQ of 60. To hear somebody say that, 
and red flags start flying up everywhere. And you say to yourself, are you the only one that believes that? No. That's the basis of all of the emerging church movement. They're going to change theology. It's not about the method. The method is incidental. They're going to change theology. They're going to change uh, the gospel message. Now, I've got a book, and I've got people. I know people. You know how I know people? I know me. I know me. Do you know you? <laughs> you know the old man? I know this old man. I don't trust him as far as I could throw him. But I trust that book. That book is a blessed light. This book right here keeps me out of trouble. This book gives me the right way to go. I believe in Galatians, the apostle said, if I or an angel from heaven come unto you preaching any other gospel, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. And this fellow right here just told me, we're going to change the gospel. Absolutely, brother. They have to. I'll show you some of that redefinition in just a moment. Now, we're going to, read, we're going to, we're going to change the gospel, and we're going to change theology. Do you know what the word theology means? And it's a broad term that covers a lot, but it is a singular term that is the doctrine of God. Theology, okay? Christology, pneumatology, hamartiology, uh, eschatology, all of the ologies. You get all of that when you go off to Bible college. These, all, these are all important things. But theology proper is the study of God. But all of the others are lumped together when you talk about, well, he's got a degree in theology. That means he studied Christology, uh, Hamartiology, and all the rest of them. All right, what's he mean? I'm going to change the doctrine of theology. All right, listen to this statement. And this is a powerful thing, too. I am not sure I believe in God exclusively as a person anymore. I now incorporate a pantheistic view which basically means that God is in all alongside my creedal view of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Folks, that's poison. <laughs> that's poison. That's poison as it comes. You know what he just told you? He told you, I am a westernized Hindu. I am a 21st century Hindu. Gnostic. I am a heretic of the first order that I believe what Plato taught about the monad. You know, I've been going through this ad nauseum in Sunday school, but you see the connection now? Here's a direct connection. Here is an emerging church pastor telling you, I don't see God anymore like the Bible teaches. The Bible's irrelevant anyway. You know, I don't care anything about, what, about God in that sense. I believe God is in all. There's this great oneness, this great presence, this great spiritual uh, pleroma, and that uh, you become one with that. And uh, it's about the greatness that is in you. Let me tell you what it's about. It's about the great one in you. Not the greatness. All right, now here we go. We've got a church where people have a worship experience. And then when the fellow gets up and he sits on the stool, he gets up there and tells them, there's another gospel. He tells them, your concept of God's all wrong. He tells them, it's okay for a woman to be with a woman or a man to be with a man. All this morality is old stuff. We have a new type of morality. Imagine now, don't you think that that would be appealing to people who just want to don't you think so? You ever wonder why they can fill up stadiums? Isn't that amazing? You know what? You know what I think happens to people a lot of times? When they hear something like that, it's such a shocking thing that they have a hard time believing it. A lot of times they'll hear me say something from the pulpit about something like that, and they'll think, is that preacher off his rocker? I mean, it couldn't be that bad. And then they'll run into somebody, and they'll find out it is that bad. 
God's given us a precious gift here at Temple. I saw the trend 30 years ago when it was all about feelings and about excitement and about emotions and a shallowness, shallowness of the Bible. They didn't have any love for Scripture. Our love should be for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am. Quoted Calvin. I know. I know. The, the thing, here's the thing with radio stations, Christian radio stations. It's like religious bookstores. They have to move so much, so many books, okay? Exactly. They have to appeal to as broad an audience as they can. So what it is, it's just a, it's just like, like a cafeteria. Yes. Yeah. 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 But there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people who, who, who hold John Calvin in high esteem. A lot of people. What everybody in America needs to do is to see the statue that has been raised to Michael Servetus. They need to see that statue. I forget where it is, it's in Europe over there somewhere. Just type it in a Google, do a Google search and it'll show you the statue. And that statue has a plaque on it. And Michael Servetus was a Spaniard, he was a doctor, and he did not accept Calvin's definition of the Trinity. And, uh, and because of that, he was burned at the stake. He died a horrible death. And uh, we have had people uh, here's, here's one of the most insidious things that can happen to you or anybody else. It's when somebody comes into the church, they come into a church like this or any other church, and they, got, they start going from person to person, and they start making disciples. In other words, they start teaching something that's different from what that church believes. Now, every person has a right to your belief. This is America. Well, what a person like that needs to do is to find a church that believes what they believe. Yeah. Instead of trying to convert people inside a church, that's unethical, that's immoral, and that's dead wrong. That's wrong. And I put a challenge out there again tonight to every Calvinist in Knoxville and every Calvinist in this country, and I have yet to have one call me. They won't call me. They never will because they can't answer it. But here's the challenge. I don't argue about election. That's a Bible doctrine. That's as clear as it can be. My point is simply this. Show me one passage in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says just because you're not elect, you're going to hell. It's not in there. Just like the angels, the elect angels. Just like election and a lot of things. I don't argue with election. That's a Bible doctrine. My argument is Cannot God Almighty save outside of election? Certainly he can. Their doctrine is, if you're not one of the elect, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't even, you can't cry out to God. You can't beg and plead. You're going to hell. That's Calvin's doctrine. That's hyper-Calvinism. Yes, sir. That's very true, brother. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. It's all to it's all now an experience. It's all how you feel. <coughs> oh no. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Exactly. Exactly. And you can see now the trend that's developing among the people in, the, in America, especially. They worship people. They're worshiping people. I've never seen as many people worship people. Easy for the Antichrist to step in and receive worship. A man on earth because they're accustomed to worshiping people. People that spend all their time looking at people are very little people. They're very little. They're small people. If all you do day in and day out is watch soap operas, listen to the talk shows, and, and, and get the magazines and see who's dating who and who divorced who and who did this and who did that, you live in a very shallow little world. And I don't want to be mean to, with you tonight, but I'm telling you, you live in a very shallow little world. There is much, 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 much more to life than spending all your time focusing on who left who and who's doing this and who won that and uh, all that junk. That's, that's as petty as it can be. Nothing is more petty than that than to spend all your time focusing your life on junk like that. That's garbage. That's garbage. Lift up your head. Talk to that one up there. Ask him to give you life. Ask him to show you what life's about. Ask him to put something inside. When you saved you, ask him to put something in you that begins to unfold in your soul what you are in this world for. Why am I here? Am I here to sit in front of a television set all day long and, and uh, as the world burns and as the rest of that stuff goes on, <laughs> day in and day out? You know, you know why they call them soap operas? Back in the 50s when they first came on, all they did was sell soap. <laughs> That's right. And they, so they called them soap operas. And some people do, though. I heard the story of one lady. She came into church, and she got up during prayer meeting and said, Would you please pray for so-and-so on such-and-such a soap opera? I mean, they're about to lose their baby. She could not separate reality from a farce. That's sad. That's sad. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure they can. They sh yeah. <laughs> you got enough drama? I do too, brother. I do too. I don't need anybody else's drama. <laughs> I got enough dog fighting going on a lot of times in my life. I don't, I don't. But it is addictive, I'm sure of that. <laughs> Amen. Well, God bless you. Brother Eric Knapsiger is going to sing for us tonight. Is this the 14th?